Hey everyone, a big welcome back to the Nick Elson Show, Season 7, Episode 3. Uh, thank you for all the comments and uh, all the responses to the episode with Mark Pugh last week. Uh, absolutely fantastic episode. I keep promising you to bring you amazing guests, and this week, absolutely no exception. We have the wonderful, the one, the only, Becca Timmins! <laughs> How are you? I'm very well, thank you. That was a lovely introduction. Thank you very much. <laughs> you want to record that and pop it as your ringtone? That'd be fine. Yeah, I think I might. I think I might. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so myself and, and Becca, our paths crossed through uh, our work in a community called NextGen. Uh, so some of you may remember from previous seasons, people like Dan Graham, Adam Owen, uh, Rohan have all been on this from the NextGen um, platform, the, the community. Uh, it's essentially a community to support financial planners. Um, and uh, myself and Becca were both speaking at the same event earlier in the year in a lovely monastery uh, in Manchester. It's a beautiful yeah. venue, wasn't it? It was. Um, and I just really liked your vibe. And I liked your vibe before I even met you, which is always a good start for me. I'm a big fluffy guy. I work a lot of the vibe. <laughs> <laughs> you gave a really good vibe. So we kind of connected. We started chatting. We met uh, at the event. And I said, you need to come on the show and just tell us all about you. Hence, you are here. So without any further ado, Becca Timmins, tell us who you are, what you do, and where you're from. Think like you're on the chase or something. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, so I am... Oh, where to start? So I'm I'm from all over the place, really, which maybe I'll talk a little bit about. Um, grew up in the Midlands and then in Surrey and sort of have ended up in Bedfordshire now, um, just because that's sort of where I've ended up, really. Um, I, I have a couple of things going on in my professional life, I suppose. I've been in financial planning, so as an operations director for well, about 15 years, I've been in that kind of operations side of things, but been in and around financial planning for like 20 plus years. But um more recently, in the last few years, I've been starting to work with other businesses. So we, we've done a lot to transform the culture and where, where I've been working for a long time. Um, and just seen that work really well and wanting to sort of take that out there and, and improve how other people work as well. Um, improve how inclusive cultures are so that people are hearing from everybody within their business, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And the name of your kind of business, your organisation, what's 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 that about? So I'm When We Think now. That's that. um, that's so cool. Point. The um so the, the panel we were on were talking about kind of culture and diversity and inclusion and lots of different things around that piece. And again, it's such a it's such a big topic, and we absolutely will come to that. We'll come to the present day. But again, this show, this episode, this series is all about the this personal story, the human experience behind the brand that people would see on LinkedIn or on your CV, for example, um, to give people the story behind the scenes, I guess. Um, so tell us about Baby Becca. Tell us about kind of growing up. Tell us about education and family life and what was like for you uh, back at the start of your journey. Cool. So I, I was really lucky. I had a, a very, um, very secure, loving family, grew up um, with mum and dad and, and two brothers and as I say we moved around a bit so my dad is um, an Anglican priest um, and has been since I was very small so I started my life actually when um, the first couple of years were when he was at theological college so I was surrounded by lots of students when I was younger and apparently my mum and dad tell stories of me kind of dragging these um, young men into my Wendy house in my bedroom to like play and do uh, like tea parties and things with them so I guess I've always been surrounded by a lot of adults right like right from when right from very early on and I think um that gave me a bit of a like you need to be a good girl mm. vibe yeah um, and and I think I always was you know I was very kind of compliant um young person I think but as I, I kind of alluded to earlier we moved around quite a lot because I, I don't know whether you know but as priests are training they kind of have to move every few years to go to new parishes and we lived in inner city Birmingham for a while when I was young then moved to very rural Shropshire, which was, uh, you know, completely different. Um, but then when I was about nine or so, eight or nine, I had a, a bit of a, I guess, a bit of a turbulent year. Um, I was not very well. I was in hospital for a few weeks. So mum and dad were kind of having to uh, having to to and fro. Mum stayed with me a lot. Um, and then turned out that while I was in hospital, she was pregnant with my youngest brother who arrived later that year. And then we moved again. So we moved from Shropshire down to Surrey, which... Um, and I think the whole kind of that whole year, I, I 
with hindsight, I think it was quite difficult mm. um, and threw me into a place that I just felt very different, I think. Um, so it's quite an affluent area. We were not far from Guildford. That wasn't what I'd grown up with. And actually, you know, priests don't have a lot of money. They get the house that comes with the job, but they, they don't have a lot of money. And so I did sort of feel on, on the outside of that. And I think from then kind of was never really sure of my place, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but yeah, continued to be a good girl, got through education, did very well in my GCSEs, slightly less well in my A-levels because I discovered booze by then. <laughs> and <laughs> was having far too much fun. Um, but then, yeah, went to a uh, university in Southampton to study mm. acoustics and music, believe it or not. Um, wow. So doing. Is that something you've kind of uh, pursued in, in current life, future life, that kind of uh, music or playing? or? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I had a bit of a... Well, quite a long hiatus from it really until probably my early 30s um and then uh, a good friend of mine who is a guitarist was like oh you can sing can't you I really want really want to start up a band again so we we started a band and so we had a few years um a few years going around pub, local pubs and playing covers and things nice. what's yeah. your kind of genre of music um re- well really broad but if if I had a go to it would probably be like 90s rock anything kind of guitar based and that kind of era is good I like that that's a good genre actually I like that it's very very much fun I like that yeah yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. <laughs> it's interesting I find that see you, you mentioned kind of the growing up in in a kind of a, a family with with faith and religion and practicing religion as well then going to university and in your words finding alcohol and that kind of stuff was there any that kind of that rebellious choice or was it just something you were just discovering yourself? I mean, I think there was a bit, although, I mean, to be fair, my my parents were, you know, they were they were strict in terms of keeping us safe, but not, you know, that it was I didn't ever feel kind of really restricted as I was growing up. So I didn't have that kind of massive going off the rails moment. Um, but I think there was a bit of kicking back. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So after after university, what was your kind of first steps into professional career? Yeah, so at, at the time, my um, my well boyfriend then, who became husband, and we're, we're no longer together now, but that's a whole other story. Um, but he, both of us, had done this acoustics degree, and um, and he got a job in that field. And as you can imagine, there aren't that many jobs in kind of engineering acoustics around the place. Um, so we ended up moving to Hertfordshire. Um, and I kind of I just fell into jobs from there, really, a um, couple of sort of early admin kind of things and then found myself in a financial financial advising business. Um, and yeah, I don't know, just thought, OK, well, there's there's something I can do here. There were exams I could take. I could, again, be a good girl and pass my exams and, you know, get on. Um, and then, yeah, a few years later, found myself at, at Emory Little again, like next step in the career path, which is. Yeah, for my sins, where I've stayed for the last 20 years, um, various roles within that business. But yeah, been there yeah two, two really fascinating things that kind of popped up from that, from you sharing that. So I think the first one was that that given your uh, kind of open relationship with money and finances and recognising the different affluence of geographical areas that you fell into financial planning. And the second piece is that you fell into financial planning. I think everybody I've spoken to in the financial planning space is that they fell into this. Does anyone ever grow up wanting to be a financial planner? <laughs> Does everybody fall into it? <laughs> well, I don't know. I think it's becoming with next gen, particularly yeah. doing some great work. There are now financial planning degree courses around the place. So I think it is becoming more common. I mean, I, actually, my um my son is doing a, a, a BTEC in business and finance. So I think finance and education is becoming is becoming more of a thing and more yeah. widely known, um, which I think is amazing. You know, he's actually learning about debt and, you yeah. know, about personal finances at 16, which, you know, I wish I'd had that. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it's becoming more so. I think of my generation and probably, you know, up to about five years, 10 years below younger than me. Yeah. I think most people fell into it for sure. I think certainly the, the the financial well-being element in in every sense of the term, because it's a very subjective term, means different things to different people mm-hmm. anyway. But mm-hmm. I think it's a really important thing that we we, we don't seem to, to educate young people with or about the, the kind of financial element of life. And mm-hmm. um, as we know, we, we've both kind of heard each other's experiences around this stuff. It has a big conditioning impact on us. Mm-hmm. And as I said, you recognise that from moving to... Birmingham to uh, the South East and recognising that kind of, I still find it interesting you ended up in in financial planning when that was quite a, a formative rec- recognition in your youth kind of thing. 
mm. your relationship yeah. with money. And yes, yeah, I just find it really a fascinating thing. Why do people do what they do? Um, and it's nice to hear this this journey that we don't see in any depth on a LinkedIn profile. Mm. Mm, definitely where you are today you have um uh, when we think you uh, but do you also still operate in as a financial planner or as a fun, uh, as an ops person in the financial planning space or so no i mean i've stepped back from um the ops role we brought somebody new and realized it was it, it, i'd kind of gone part-time a couple of years ago to to pursue other things we, we went through quite a turbulent time within the business for um a, a succession from dad to daughter which you can probably imagine wasn't the smoothest of rides mm. um and, you know, at that time, I'd start I'd seen how um, the thinking environment, which is what I now I now work with a lot, had had this incredible transformational impact on the business and the culture of the business. Uh, I really wanted to start taking it into other teams and started coaching as well. Mm. So I went part time a couple of years ago and gradually we realized that we the business was growing and, you know, going on to bigger and better things and a lot of work needed to be done. And I just couldn't do it in the time that I had. And uh, and so earlier this year, well, back end of last year, we started recruiting and we brought a new head of ops in earlier this year. So, yeah, my role is a little bit transitional at the moment. Not quite sure what, what I'll be called at the moment. I'm head of people and culture, but who knows? I think that's going to morph again. But, yeah, really um, now all about all about the culture really and making sure that we're running great meetings and that we're um, including everybody that we're hearing from all the right people, coaching a couple of the team as well. Um, and yeah, lots of kind of facilitation and, and bits and pieces, which is, I guess, what what I'm hoping and what, what we're hoping really is that um, that business kind of becomes my biggest client yeah. in the work that I'm doing. So I'm kind of doing the same stuff across my business and, and with them as well. So you mentioned when we think, and obviously it seems now obvious from your interest and passion around culture. When did it actually come into your brain as this could be a great idea? I can do this. This is something I can do for me. How did that kind of happen? Because very often a light bulb moment isn't by design. It can very happen by circumstance, as you say. Mm -hmm. uh, but what was that first thought process that led you to believe? this is what I can do and this is going to be my thing because actually it's quite scary in that sense that to as somebody myself who had a an employed career of decades that actually to take that final leap I needed quite a big catalyst to do that mm -hmm. and it was really scary actually as much as it was exciting and liberating it was really scary as well so how did that thought process kind of pan out for you I think it still is to be honest, yeah. um, I've I've been really fortunate and continue to be very fortunate that I'm, I guess I'm still valued in that Emory Little world as well. Um, having stepped back from the ops side, because the thinking environment and what I do is so core to the culture there. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm hoping that they'll remain kind of my biggest client going forward. And so that gives me a bit of financial security. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I guess there's something in having been somewhere for 20 years. You know, I've invested a lot in that business love the team brilliant brilliant team the leadership team are amazing um they're a great team. yeah they definitely are so so yeah i guess it's still something that i'm i'm battling with and, and quite uh actively at the moment really because uh, you know i have deliberately made that step back earlier this year i know that my hours there are going to reduce further at some stage and you know so now like i've, I've got to make a go of this now i, I have to so um and i, I guess one of the things that's been quite interesting and, and you picking up on the, you know, how did I end up in finance when I had this, these kind of formative experiences? I, I almost feel like I've kind of come full circle now. So dad, as I say, is, is a priest, but mum was a speech and language therapist and worked with kids a lot. So there's a lot of that kind of supporting other people yeah. that was in my family background. And, and I think that it feels almost more natural to me now than... Yeah the processes and you know that the stuff and the management of that ops role um so it, it's almost like I've kind of belatedly discovered perhaps what I should have been thinking about all along yeah absolutely so if I was to say kind of that elevator pitch kind of moment tell us about when we think what what do you bring to people what do you do so I guess my my thing is potential I'm I have a bit of a a knack for spotting where there's potential in people, in businesses, in, in processes, it, wh wherever. I do have a bit of a knack for kind of spotting that. And I guess what I'm really all about is it, supporting people to find their own potential. 
and teaching others to do that for other people as well um, and that the way that I found works incredibly is this thing called the thinking environment which is based on the work of Nancy Klein time to think is is her first book that talks about okay. it um, yeah which is it all it's all about a kind of a way of being with other people yeah. that supports their very best thinking and and enables people feel to feel safe to really think for themselves and as themselves um, which is yeah it's quite a special thing Absolutely. The past couple of weeks, I've been on tour with a client on their um, and their financial services, financial planning company, uh, do a UK tour. And I've been one of the speakers on the tour and just listening to the other speakers, the experts in financial services, pensions, financial planning, that there's so much change within that industry. And literally month to month, you have draft regulations, You so many things you have to kind of to know in that space actually as we know change can be quite difficult to deal with mm -hmm. from a cultural perspective how do you coach people to to thrive through periods of change or fast-paced environment yeah I mean that's something that we're learning all the time I think and, and trying to get trying to get better at I, I think listening is really key I think actually listening to people's experiences um what's going on listening to the people that are actually impacted by the change because I think very often um, and I, I find this in lots of businesses actually that I, I go in and work with the the management team will drive a change and they've decided that it's a good thing and that it needs to happen and it's almost like well if, if we just squeeze a bit hard if we just push this harder then it will happen eventually and everyone will get on board and it will be fine but I think what that risks I, I don't know if you're familiar with the change curve which is very kind of yes very similar to the the stages of grief actually you know people have this this reaction to change you know fear kicks in all sorts of things start to kick in especially if it's a, a big change and i think if we can really listen to people um educate share more than we think we can because I, I think transparency is hugely important very often you know leaders will try to keep it all to themselves this is my responsibility i'll hold all i'll hold all the all the bad stuff you know I'll, I'll hold all of these these decisions and things and I think it can make people feel quite disconnected from what's really going on um, and I think if we listen really well um, we hear insights from all sorts of you know different areas within the business mm. that can help us to navigate change together and not to feel like it's a kind of them and us or that you know one person is forcing change on you know or one group is forcing change on somebody else I think if if we can do things much more collaboratively then that makes a huge huge difference to people's uh, I guess ability to navigate change more smoothly um, yeah. and with, which, with, yeah, just, which essentially I guess is is the ultimate resilience piece isn't it mm, yeah what you get out of it is the unexpected. I guarantee you will find something out about yourself. I got up and stood and said something, and I would never have done that before. Find Your Voice Live is our flagship event where we cross the boundaries of personal development, mental health, transformation, and public speaking. And I just find it a really, really good, safe place to stand up and talk. It's so great at firing people up, but in a way that's on our own terms and what works for you. So I've been invited to a lot of stage talks, a lot of exhibitions, and I felt like I needed to sort of improve on the way um, I sort of portray myself and come across during these talks. One of the, the biggest things I, I think is um, the use of storytelling, but also um, how we can um, influence people through taking them through a journey of different emotions. And give my own presentation style, my own speaking style, a little bit of all this. It gives you so much more confidence. It shows you that, you know, there is nothing to be worried about. It's just, yeah. If someone was really on the fence about this, I would just say, what have you actually got to lose? It's all about getting out of your comfort zone and this will do it in a very organic and enriched way. Definitely come to this event. <laughs> yeah, just come. Just commit to it, just go for it. Um, well worth the three hour journey for that.
You mentioned the the change curve. Is that the is it Kubler Ross model? Yeah. Without putting you on the spot, and if you don't know this, do you know? Could you explain that to people that don't know about that? Because I couldn't. I'll be honest. <laughs> If not, I'll just put a link in it in the bio. But can you explain that to people? Or is that something? Yeah, I mean, probably do put a link in because I won't do it justice. Um, but it essentially, <laughs> when, when... on this show, we'll just have an open conversation <laughs> and just see what you think. <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, essentially, to start with, there's there's often a bit of a positive um, uptick in kind of uh, performance or response to a change. But then quite quickly, we, we experience a dip. We start to get into the fear and the, you know, what might happen and, you know, might this change affect my job security even? Or, you know, those sorts of things could start to come up for people, you know, especially if it's kind of structural change within an organisation. Mm. And we, we sort of hit this, the curve then hits a, a low where, you know, and often I think just expecting that to happen as a leader, there will be a point, there will be a dip once, you know, we start to change things. I think Brené Brown calls it like day day two, like that you can't skip that middle bit or the messy middle. You can't kind of skip that middle bit. But then, you know, things start to change and things start to, you know, people start to kind of engage a bit with the change and start to think, oh, OK, well, maybe there's some possibilities here. Try Start to ch- sort of experiment. And gradually, you you know, you see this uptick in performance and in feeling around whatever's changing um, to a, hopefully to a point where things peak above, you know, where they were when they started. Brilliant job. I love that. Cool. <laughs> well done, by the way. <laughs> Start putting you on the spot. I, I think that, there's, again, there's, there's so many rabbit holes I could dive down with you because the, I love what you talk about. The untapped potential thing is an interesting one. that, um, And you would have heard me say this on Friday to, to many people. And that, um, so you came to my Find Your Voice event uh, on Friday. Um, and I, I get that. You, you see, I wish people could see what we see in them, but they don't. Why is that? And I guess there's lots of different reasons, but I think that's maybe the thing that drives both of us to to do what we do in our respective field is that untapped potential element. But to the backdrop of the past few and a half years, maybe, one of the things that maybe has gone missing is our, our aspiration or our investment in development personally and professionally. That can really stunt potential, right? Yeah, definitely. I, it's interesting you say that. I, ha- I I don't think I've experienced that in in my immediate world anyway, I think, I guess I I mentioned the MBO earlier and that happened in 2021. So all the way through 2020, when we'd all gone into lockdown, you know, we were, we were having to work through this very difficult situation. Um, You know, you you can understand that, you know, succession from dad to daughter is is always going to be fraught with lots of emotion Um, and that, you know, that, that spills out. So, I think because we were going through that and because we were all and then from 2021 onwards really having to step up you know we own this business now we've got to we've really got to step up I think our personal growth didn't stop like I think if anything we doubled down yeah on that and needed to to sort of support ourselves through that and I guess that's you know another part of the change curve like what what can you do to sort of resource yourself and support yourself so we've all been in coaching some of us therapy at times you know all sorts to to sort of see us through all of those bumpier times in, in the best way possible. It's really refreshing because I said um, a lot of people kind of went straight into survival mode and just coping day to day. And I think especially given that the the industry that you you specialise in is very forward thinking by nature of, of the beast, I guess, that is always planning, it's always... Just, so maybe that's the thing, maybe it's the industry that drove it through that kind of thought process that ha- that's how it's given you the platform and the tools to to thrive. It's an amazing thing, really. But again, that comes back to culture and and how you set the culture as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, it's forward thinking in some ways, our industry, and still the average age of a financial planner is 56 and there, you know, there are a lot of white men. <laughs> so, you know, um, it's forward thinking to a point. To a point, um, <laughs> to a degree. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I think I do think the culture that we've built is is pretty special, um, yeah. and it's been it's been something that we've we've curated quite deliberately. Um, and that's not to say you know there's, there are plenty of other. I, I guess that there's a difference between, in my mind, kind of older school financial advisors and the the newer generation, this next generation of, of financial planners. And that's not just younger people. You know, there's there's a whole range of ages and. Um, in that but there is a difference in the people that are 
really committed to understanding deeply understanding their clients and where they want to go with their lives and you know what's really important to them and learning those kind of coaching skills to get them there and then yeah being technically excellent as well to create a great financial plan for them but so yeah I think there's there is a bit of an old school but I think there's very much an emerging new school as well that would fall into that. I agree I, I think you're right I mean given the fact that I talk about uh, mental health to to kind of um, very established financial planners and uh, and wealth management companies. Mm-hmm. I absolutely get that that some people get it and some people don't and, and some people don't understand it. Some people do. I, like you say, the culture is changing. But it's changing because of the work that people like you and and next gen as an example as a community are doing as well. It is an interesting one, but I think it's again it's that kind of absolutely generational but also sometimes cultural as well speaking to people from other races and backgrounds and walks of life and ways of life it all has an impact on how we look at things around mental health or coaching and and any form of development I guess as a 45 year old guy when I first was trained corporately to lead in that sense because I was leading from a very young age in my corporate career that I was told to lead through instruction so you tell people what to do and they do it (laughs) <laughs> breaking news doesn't work anymore um <laughs> and if you didn't do what you tell them to do you convince them to do it on no uncertain terms and i think and now it's about leading through influences about emotional leadership and that's exactly your kind of sweet spot i guess isn't it it's kind of is is giving people the the tools to bring people with them is that is that right yeah i think so definitely i mean there's um, i'm sure you're familiar with um, google's project aristotle like it was i think 2012 um, that the, the results of that came out and it, it very strongly said that the top determining factor in high performing teams is psychological safety. Like, blimey, like that's that's massive compared to that top down leadership style that was yeah. you know prevalent in the 80s and 90s, which is exactly what you've just just described that, you know, do what I say. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's completely the opposite of that. And I think what um, what I found in the thinking environment and, and then introduced at Emory Little was like the how psychological yeah. safety is a very fluffy term you know how how do you make people feel safe to to speak up and to say what they really think and to care more about what they think than of what other people think of their thinking especially when you've got power dynamics which you you just it, as much as you try to flatten the hierarchy it always exists and I, I think the thinking environment has just it gave me the tools to like to see how that was possible um and that was what i just felt was missing i thought you know, a lot of places just they don't have the tools that so many businesses that I go into are so well meaning. Well, you know, all of them are most people are just trying to do a good job yeah. and trying to do right by their teams um, and just, you know, missing the mark because they, they weren't listening and you know taking too much on themselves and going into a fixing mode rather than listening and coaching and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's what's made the difference for me, I think. Have you ever experienced any major pushback from people that you're trying to help? clients or individuals yeah I mean um we got quite a lot of resistance early days at Emory Little definitely um and and I think at the time I didn't really know about the change curve and I wish I had because I think I would have handled things differently um and looking back on it that was what was happening people are resistant to change um and and actually at that time I I had learned about it we hadn't learned about it together. I'd learned about it. And then there was a whole like, oh, manager's been on a course kind of reaction, which I think you often get. Um, and yeah, I mean, people, one of the things that we do now, and it's completely normal, is we have an opening round. Everybody speaks, much like you did on Friday, actually. Yeah. Everybody speaks and shares something. You know, we could ask a question, all sorts of questions. What's made you smile recently or something personal yeah. to land in the room as people first. And people really resisted that. Like it's it's not this isn't appropriate. This is personal. This is work. You know this that's personal stuff. And um, and gradually there was a realization that actually it's quite nice to hear more about each other and to be people first and then you know job roles second. Um, and I think a big difference that I find when I take this into teams now is is I'm teaching the whole team together, giving them a shared language. And although I sometimes we'll still get a bit of pushback. Um, it's a lot less, I think, when people are kind of hearing the why and hearing how people are responding to doing things in this different way. I think the people that are, that probably find it most difficult are the more kind of traditional, um, often older, but not always, but the more traditional leaders who 
have tended to dominate the floor when in you know in in meetings and so on and actually that they have to shut up more to make space for other people in in this kind of methodology so um so yeah there's definitely kickback but i i normally find that by hearing from those quieter people who perhaps haven't spoken in a meeting for the last six months which you know there's plenty of them out there yeah by hearing from them and suddenly realizing that well if we do things in this way that person's got some really useful insights actually um and you know people start hearing well what you know why weren't you speaking up before and it's more about I don't know like I I don't have the energy to cut through when everybody else is talking or you know I'm not going to put myself out there Mm -hmm. rather than I've got nothing to say and I I think when people start realizing that then then changes really start to kick in yeah absolutely And, and is your your kind of working life um hybrid is it majority in person majority virtual or truly down the middle or depends on the week completely <laughs> uh, i would say it's yeah hybrid um probably more virtual now yeah. than um than in person but the tide is changing the tide is turning again okay. um more people are wanting in person when i'm working with teams i tend to do most of it in person but then it does depend you know if you're working with a team that has all their meetings virtually then teach them how to have good virtual meetings online you know um, <laughs> yeah. so yeah it, it does depend on the team but it's, it's a bit of a mixture do you feel you get the same level of engagement um, in person as you do online or does it depend on what you're actually working with and who you're working with at the time? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends more on the people, I think, and the team and um, and how how bought in they are before they arrive. Um, I tend to speak to everybody one on one before we arrive together, um, which really, really helps. I, I've found I, I don't see a huge difference, to be honest, between virtual and, and in person. There is obviously there is a difference of just vibe of being in the room together. You kind of and you can see people's body language more easily and all that kind of stuff. So I think that there is something there is something different about it. And one of the things that saw us into lockdown really smoothly at Emory Little was that we had this way of running meetings, which actually trans transfers incredibly well online from in person. So our Monday morning team meeting, it looked no different to how it looked every time we met, you know, in the office. It was just all of a sudden the order that we used was, you know, the, the Zoom screen. It wasn't just, you know, physically going around the room. So, yeah, it works really well on both. Your passion for helping people. Very often you find that it's people that have had really poor experiences of being managed not very well, treated not very well. Uh, is that been a driver for you or actually is it not is it your passion to help people now does it come from having poor experiences yourself um i i definitely had experiences of command and control that sort of top down um and and i think you know i meant i mentioned a couple of times i was a good girl you know that and that's it's still a driver for me to be good is still a driver yeah. and i think I've been quite compliant and, I, and I've just thought, well, this is just the way things are done. You know, I I did things in a very kind of conventional order. You know, I went to university, I got married, I bought a house, I had children. You know, I did everything that was very conventional for me up to a point um, when, you know, things moved very differently in my life. But I, so I, I think I've I kind of followed that. Uh, this is just how it's done. You know, I, I joined Emory Little when I was in my early 20s. I didn't know any different. And actually the, the founder was very driven um you know a a, a brilliant man actually really um incredibly creative lots of great stuff about him and you know and i think it just you know there's that great book what got you here won't get you there um and i think we just kind of hit that and so yeah we did have some we did have some difficult years but you know I, i i took on that as well i was very much like well this is how i do it you know i've got to keep the difficult stuff to myself vulnerability you know, no, don't go there. Um, and, you know, I just need to kind of tell people what to do. I, I need to fix the problems and then give them the solutions. And so I saw myself doing it badly, I think, and, and suddenly had this bit of a revelation, really, that, oh, there's another way. Yeah. Oh, and this way is much better. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I, I think I have had those experience, experiences, but I've also been there myself. Yeah, absolutely. So that kind of question, I guess, applies then. Who looks after the people that looks after people? How do you how do you recharge your batteries when you are not working, not in your work mode? What do you love to do? Um, well, I've got three boys, um, so they keep me very busy. Walking, 
particularly walking with friends, being in nature is definitely a big recharge for me. I also I try and get up and practice yoga every morning. Like that's a yeah. I've tried mindfulness as well, but I find like a balancing pose in yoga, like you can't get any more present moment than that. So um so yeah, that's that's one of my things. But I also I have um so I have coaching myself like that's one of the things that I think is is vitally important and it's all again thinking environment coaching it's basically space for me to work out what I think yeah. for me to just explore my own thoughts it's incredibly non-directive um and that's that's been the biggest gift in my life really apart from probably my kids and my partner you know um I, I've got to know over the last few years like, who who am I what yeah. do I really think, you know, caring more about that than what other people think of my thinking and other people think of me. Um, so that's a, a huge recharge in my life or just a kind of settling moment every, at least once a fortnight, if not once a week. I have this probably 45 minutes to just explore what I think about whatever's going on in my life. And that's that's a huge um, level of it. It just it just keeps me grounded. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's thank really you. And I, I think it's also a really important point that, Coaches have coaches, mentors have mentors, and counsellors have counsellors. That is such an important thing. I guess how did you how did you go through the process? If you did go through a process of choosing the coach that you work with, um, or was it a relationship that you had? Or because I, I found what you through different phases of your personal and professional life, it's kind of like horses for courses. I guess there have been certain people that have helped me along the way at certain points, but. How did you go through the process of choosing the coach that is obviously doing fantastic things with you because you're glowing about it? <laughs> well, so it's a bit of a mixture for me. So part of my ongoing professional development is that I have to meet regularly with another thinking partnership teacher. Mm -hmm. And we have to have we have thinking sessions together. So it's kind of part of my professional development and, and built in. So um, that's that's something I do. I have a couple of regular thinking partners that I, I think with. Uh, I also then. Sorry. So that's really interesting. I didn't realize that. So that's very much kind of like the um, the the counselor and the, and the supervisory kind of counseling. So they, they kind of have that kind of guidance and, and space to bounce around what they were doing and what they're working on right now with with a supervisor is that correct not well not quite so i, I do supervision groups as well um absolutely okay. I, I do go for supervision but um a thinking partnership is it's a it's a, essentially if i've got 40 minutes as my thinking session for example it's 40 minutes for me to think independently on a topic of my choosing okay. and i bring anything there, there are ways that a thinking partner will will support me in doing that but it's part of my practice. Effectively, I, I think with a partner who is a peer of mine and we just we will have 40 minutes each on the topic that each of us bring. Sometimes we'll ask for each other's input, but very often I will just spend 40 minutes. Like a lot of people think, how do you talk for 40 minutes? But I will just spend 40 minutes exploring what's going on for me at that time or a particular thing that I'm struggling with or, or whatever. So um so, yeah, and I, I do. I also have a coach who I see a bit less regularly who's, who gives me more input, I suppose, because I think that's important, too, and challenges me and challenges my thinking. Um, but that that thinking partnership session that I have very regularly is it's not for that. It's it's for me. It's for me to explore what I think, um, which is not many people have that. As I say, it's, it's been a real gift in my life. Yeah, I find that really insightful. Thank you. What's next? What's next, Rebecca Timmins? Well, I am currently in the process of developing um, a coaching course, coaching qualification for financial planners. Um, the, yeah, based on the thinking partnership. And there's lots of work around unpicking um, assumptions that, that sort of form part of that. And so yeah. much of our behaviour around money is, is assumptions based. So, um, so yeah, I'm working on that, hoping to launch that. Um, well, launching it fairly soon, but I, I think the, that'll run from next year. Um, so that's that's a big part of it. And I'm really just getting myself out there a bit more, stepping outside my comfort zone, doing things like this, speaking more um, and spreading the word about the thinking environment, I suppose, because it's it has been completely transformational for me personally, but also for, for the businesses that I've seen it, it um, rolled out. In. Absolutely. Thank you. So the question I ask everybody that comes on this show, yeah, and you got to choose on Friday as well. You actually did this in real life. Um, I'm now announcing you to the stage on the MC of the O2 Arena in London. 20,000 people chanting your name. You're sat back in the green room and your walk-on music kicks in. What is your walk-on music of choice and why? 
Okay, so, well, Friday I went for Son of a Preacher Man by Dusty Springfield just because <laughs> it's an amazing tune. But actually, when I thought about it over the weekend, I thought, like, is there something that's more um, relevant to me, I suppose? And the song that came up for me was um, The Middle by Jimmy Eat World. Uh, I don't know if you know it, but it's... Um, really? yeah. yeah, so the one of the verses says, um, just try your best, try everything you can, and don't you worry what they tell themselves when you're away. And I thought that was pretty appropriate, really. That is so cool and such a great addition to the playlist. So this and every other choice from Season 7 will be available on the playlist at the end of the season. So if you do want to reach out and connect and ask questions, Rebecca, I know she'll be delighted to hear from you. All of the details can be found in the blurb. So please do uh, check Becca out. Becca, any parting wisdom you want to leave us with? Oh, make time to think. Just give yourself time to think. What a beautiful message to end this with. I love that. Thank you. Becca, give it up. <laughs> Thank you so much for being such an amazing guest on the show, Becca. I hope everybody else has enjoyed it as much as I have. Absolutely have. Uh, really excited to bring you another another guest next Monday. So please do hit like, subscribe and all that jazz. You know I'm not a details guy. Whatever it takes to get you back here next Monday, do that thing. And in the meantime, be happy, stay well, take care and make some time for yourself. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.